Okay, <clears throat> the double angle formulas are actually derived from the sum and difference formulas, and I'm not going to prove it for all of them. I'm just going to discuss it really briefly. I'll show you how it happened for this first identity. What they did was they started out with the sine of a plus b identity, which says sine of a cosine of b plus cosine of a sine of b. And all they did was they took angle b and they made it angle a again. They made the two angles the same size. And so that would replace that with an a and that with an a. And so what they had was sine of a times cosine of a and another sine of a times cosine of a. So they became like terms and they added. And they got two sine of a cosine of a. Now they did the same thing for cosine. They started out with cosine of a plus b and they changed them to be a plus a and they did the same thing with tangent. The only additional thing that they did was they took this first identity right here and they can come up with these other two versions that you see right there by doing a single substitution step. So for example if I took this cosine squared right here and I replaced it with 1 minus sine squared from the first Pythagorean identity, then this would be 1 minus sine squared, and then there was another minus sine squared right there, and that's how they came up with that second version of the identity. So if you don't have the identities handy, you can derive them easily just by taking your sum identity and making both angles the same size, making it a plus a instead of a plus b. Okay, so what we've got here is there's two types of problems we do with our double angles. The first is our picture drawing. So right here we were told that angle a or alpha was in quadrant one because it's between zero and pi halves. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to draw a picture. Um, I'm just going to call it angle a just because it's easier that way. And we were told right here that the sine of angle A was 4 fifths, so we know the opposite side is 4, and the hypotenuse is 5, which once again makes it our favorite 3, 4, 5 right triangle. And so if we are asked to evaluate sine of 2 times that angle, we're just going to do 2 times sine of the angle times cosine of the angle. Okay, and so what this allows us to do is even though we don't actually know what angle A is and we don't know how big it is, we could figure out what the sine value would be for an angle that's twice as big. So sine of A was given to us, it was 4 fifths, and cosine of A we can figure out from our picture is 3 fifths. And when we multiply those three numbers together, we get 24 20 fifths. Okay, then I'm also asked to find cosine of 2a. Now we have three choices here as to which identity we use. We can use this one, this one, or this one. Okay, in this case it doesn't matter which one we choose, but I will tell you that a lot of the time if I give you this setup right here and all I ask you for is cosine of 2a, you could avoid drawing a picture altogether by just using this version, this second version of the identity, because all it requires is the sine value. And I was given the sine value. So that's the version I'm just going to go ahead and use. Because a lot of the time it can save you from having to draw a picture. And so I have 1 minus 2, and then I have my 4 fifths, which is my sine value, and it's going to get squared from the identity. And so I follow PEMDAS. First I square my fraction, and squaring the 4 gives me 16. Squaring the 5 gives me 25. Then I double the fraction, and so I get 32 over 25. And then remember 1 is 25 over 25, and so now I can subtract and I get negative 7 over 25. Okay, and then the final thing I'm asked to do 
is find tangent of 2a. I'm going to go ahead and use the identity, but then we will talk about how in this case we do have an alternate option available to us. So I'm going to do 2 times tangent of a, which from the picture is 4 thirds, over 1 minus that same tangent value squared, so 4 thirds squared. Now a lot of the time there's a shortcut that I use to eliminate embedded fractions. Um, I'm not going to use it in this case just because I can't multiply everything through by 3 um, because this fraction right here is being squared. And so I think a lot of people would miss what the common number is to multiply that fraction through by. So I'm just going to follow PEMDAS this time just to try to avoid showing people a way that might be accident prone for a lot of people. So according to PEMDAS, I would double the fraction on top, so I'd get 8 thirds. And then I would square the fraction on bottom, which would make it 16 ninths. And then I'm not ready to multiply by a reciprocal yet because I still need to subtract in my denominator. So this is 9 ninths. Minus 16 ninths is negative 7 ninths. And now I can multiply by the reciprocal. So I have 8 thirds times negative 9 sevenths. And the 9 and the 3 reduce, and I get negative 24 sevenths as my answer. So if I knew what angle A was, and then I could double it, and I found the tangent value of that new angle, it would agree with this. Now I do have the ability to check my answer because tangent of 2a is of course sine of 2a over cosine of 2a and I knew both of those numbers. I knew sine of 2a was 24 25ths and I know cosine of 2a is negative 7 25ths. And so I could check my answer, but the reason that's not the way I actually did the problem is because most of the time on a picture drawing problem, I'll give you the setup, I'll tell you where to draw the picture, and I'm only going to ask you to find one or maybe two trig values. I very rarely ask you to find all three, and so most of the time you won't have sine and cosine to do this. But what I show is that if I multiplied by the reciprocal, so multiplied by negative 25 sevenths, I would get negative 24 sevenths, which agrees with my answer over there. So we did have that option available to us this time, even though we won't most of the time. Okay. The other type of problem we do with our double angle formulas is solving. We do no unit circle double angle problems and that's because in order to do that you would have to be doubling an angle from the unit circle but any angle on the unit circle that you double will still be a unit circle angle so there's no need for a formula to evaluate them. Okay, So we just do the picture drawing and the solving. We will do something new uh, later called proving. We're going to do trig proofs, but we are going to do that separately. Okay, so I want you to notice this is a new type of equation. This is the first time you have ever had sine and cosine attached to each other. You have had equations with sine and cosine in them, but they could always be rearranged or they could be squared or you know, they were added and subtracted to each other, or they were on opposite sides of an equation, so you could divide. It doesn't work in this case. They are physically attached to each other through multiplication. So I want you to look through your identities, and what you would see is that there's only one that does that. There is only one identity that attaches sine and cosine to each other, which is 2 times sine of a times cosine of a, is sine of 2a. So the only difference between that identity and the equation we're trying to solve is that the identity has a 2 in front of sine and cosine, 
our equation has a 4. So I'm going to take the whole equation and divide it through by 2 first. And that makes the left side of the equation become 2 sine of x cosine of x. And it makes the right side become square root of 3 over 2. Now, the left side of my equation matches this identity. And so I'm going to take it from this version of the identity to this version. I'm going to substitute. And so that takes the left side of my equation right here, and it makes it become sine of 2x. And it's equal to square root of 3 over 2. Okay, and so now I can solve it. And as soon as I rewrote it, that means I can solve it just by peeling the layers. Okay, so inverse sine to get rid of the sine. And that means I'm going to do inverse sine of square root of 3 over 2 on the right side and I'm going to write it as a general solution because I know that this 2 in front of the x is going to double my number of answers. So I'm going to answer in radians because it says 0 to 2 pi up here and I know that normally I would have two answers. Normally those two answers would be pi thirds and 2 pi thirds but I'm going to write them as general solutions because normally I would have to cycle 2 pi in any direction to generate additional answers but once again because of that 2 I'm only going to generate or I'm going to um, only have to travel half as far to generate other answers and the reason for that is because my last step to getting x by itself is to take the whole equation and multiply everything through by a half. <clears throat> so I distribute a half here and it gives, gets x by itself. Distribute the half there and it makes my initial answer pi sixth. Distribute there and it means that I don't have to travel two pi to my next answer. I only have to travel pi in any direction. Distribute here, it makes my second answer. I'm going to write it as pi thirds. You could write it as two pi sixth if you want all of your answers to have the same denominator. And then distribute there and it means plus or minus pi in any direction again. Okay, and so now I can use those general solutions to generate my four answers. And once again, remember we knew there were going to be four answers because this two in front of here doubles our number of answers and inverse sine of square root of three over two normally just has those two answers. So pi sixth was my first answer. I'm going to add pi to it to cycle to my next answer and that is 6 pi sixth so that makes my second answer 7 pi sixth. Okay, I can't add any more because if I add again I'm at 13 pi sixth which is past 2 pi. So then I go to my next solution pi thirds was my next solution. Add pi to it, which is 3 pi thirds, and I get 4 pi thirds as my final solution. And there's the four answers between 0 and 2 pi, and there's just as many as I expected there to be. Okay, the final solving problem is practice using cosine of 2 theta. Um, this equation can look a little confusing, it looks like it's got the same trig function throughout the whole equation, but it really doesn't because this one is cosine of two times an angle and this is cosine of just theta, just one times the angle. And that would be the equivalent of saying that cosine of 60 is equal to cosine of 30, which it's not. So they're really not the same trig function. So we want to solve it. We want it all to be cosine of theta. Okay, and so cosine of 2 theta, you go back and you look at the identities at the beginning and you see that it's got these three options for you here. But one of the options, this third one over here, has just cosine of A, or cosine, in this case, cosine of theta in it. 
And so that would be the identity that I choose to use. So I'm going to replace cosine of 2 theta with 2 cosine squared of theta minus 1. And it's still equal to the same thing on the right side, negative cosine of theta. Now the equation really truly is all in terms of one trig function. Not only that, but it just became a quadratic. And as soon as it became a quadratic, number one, I know I need to set it equal to zero. Number two, I know that the only quadratics that we deal with in this unit are all factorable. And number three, I have the option, if you're having trouble recognizing that it's a factorable quadratic, then you could always chunk it, and you could rewrite it as 2a squared minus 1 is equal to negative a. And then you could set it equal to 0 and factor it and solve it, and then put cosine back in. Because sometimes the trig function being in there does make it look harder or make it harder to recognize the factoring pattern. But this is a quadratic, so I do want to set it equal to 0. So 2 cosine squared of theta. I add the cosine of theta to move it over, and I have my minus 1. And now it's all equal to 0. And that makes it factorable. So 2 cosine and cosine. And of course, since there's a 1 at the end, I know it's going to be a 1 and a 1. The only thing you would have to figure out is where the plus goes and the minus goes so that you get that positive 1 cosine of theta in the middle. And so this is how it ends up factoring. So that means I have my two factors. I set them each equal to 0. And so here I end up with cosine of theta is 1 half. And then I take the second one and set it equal to zero, and I get cosine of theta is negative one. Now I want you to notice your domain is not just zero to 360, it's zero, there should be a degree symbol there, to 540. So you're going to make one and a half complete trips around your unit circle. Um, that means you can do it visually, or you could write it as a general solution. So you could here say the angle is 180 degrees and then you could do plus or minus 360 in if you want to and then that would allow you to generate that 180 was your first answer and then 540 is also an answer for this one or you could just do it visually however you wanted to do that um, I'm just going to mentally work my way around the unit circle one and a half times. So the first angle that has that this cosine value of one half is 60 degrees. Keep mentally going around the unit circle and the next one you hit is 300 degrees. And keep going halfway more around the unit circle and the last one you get is 420 degrees. And there's all of my answers. Okay, so those are the only types we do for double angles, at least in our classes, um, for now. We're going to do our proofs later, but it's just more of the same. Just new methods and new types of problems that we can solve and we can picture, draw to evaluate, and so forth.